a minute. My headset is not working again. Let's check this, by the way. Okay, I think I can be heard now from folks on Facebook. Yes, can I get an exclamation mark? There you go. Thank you. So I was saying a while ago, our topic for tonight is about exercising business meeting etiquette, observing the proper decorum, what are the do's and don'ts, and what have changed since the landscape has also changed because of the pandemic. We're going to talk about that in today's session. You know, I'm going to let people to settle in first because the reason why I chose this topic is because something quite interesting happened to me this morning with one of my clients in a meeting. And I want to talk about that. I want to rant also about it. And I want to talk about what could have happened, what should have been done to avoid that issue to happen. I hope that's cool with everyone in this session. Let me just check, by the way, my TikTok here. There you go. Dio Paul says, I thought it's our audio problem. Sorry, you know, I feel so bad. Every time I go online on Facebook, I forget to change the settings for my audio because I'm using a, a microphone. So thank you for calling me out. Okay? Give me a letter M if you have conducted or participated in a meeting in the past seven days, the past week. Just want to check. Want to check how often do you guys... And also, could you please type in the chat box, how often do you participate or preside meetings on a weekly basis? Once a week, two times a week, three times a week, four times a week. Could you please type? I would say, in my case, minimum three times a week. I think I'm lucky because there are certain days where in I only have just pure webinars or I have no meetings at all. And that's because I try to, to control if I can pull all the meetings in one day or one morning so I can get through my day continuously. I don't like killing my momentum. Usually when you have your meetings scattered all across the day, you don't get anything done for work. Agree? So when you jump into your PowerPoint or to your spreadsheet and you know that the meeting is about to happen, sometimes I get tense or anxious. I think about the meeting and I do that for 10 minutes. And then when I finally get into the meeting and then finish the meeting, it's hard for me to go back again to my recent momentum. So I don't like to scatter my meetings across the day. I'd like to have a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meeting with around 15 to 30 minutes interval so I can have space in case it prolongs and extends beyond the agreed time. Looking at the chat box, looking at the folks, uh, twice a week, says Sanrai. Jetty is asking what type of meeting, online or in a room? Both. I think a lot of universal guidelines when it comes to practicing and observing meeting etiquette applies, whether it's on Zoom or it's on site. Okay. Uh, Mikey Mouse says three. Joash says three. Okay. Fair enough. I think two times or three times a week is a fair number of meetings. I will also say this before we start with our session and take on your questions. I am a believer that a company that does too many meetings on a daily basis is set up for failure. It is set up for chaos. It is set up for disengaged employees. Because at the end of the day, if you coordinate too frequently, too many times, people don't get anything done. People will also feel that they are being monitored. People will feel that nothing is happening but tracking and checking and monitoring if they're getting the job done. And that disengages people because you don't give them space for a level of privacy, autonomy, and a level of creativity to get things done according to their own style. And as we say in Tagalog, according to their own estilo or discarte. Right? That's what makes people happy and excited with their job. Can I get an exclamation mark if you guys agree? Yes? If you're also, so Annalisa says in the Facebook uh, account, yeah, they feel suffocated. That's true. I think suffocated is the best word to describe people when there are too many meetings. Too many meetings, I think, is also a symptom that the company does not trust its employees. That's one. Or number two, it's a symptom that leaders and managers are not able to effectively communicate and cascade instructions. 
They cannot write properly because they're just not good in writing. They cannot explain it over the phone, right? Such that they have to see people face to face. I think that is poor. That is a sign of poor communication skills. The true mark of being a good communicator is that regardless of the platform, you're able to convey the message and that people are able to read, listen, and digest your words right. Yes, agree? Can I get, by the way, an exclamation mark in the chat box if we're all on the same page? If you're jumping in for the first time in our career talks, we'd love to get some hearts, some likes. Facebook, LinkedIn, guys, I need that. TikTok folks already gave us 1,100 likes, so we thank you for that. So I need more of those likes, by the way. That's the only way for us to be able to reach out and improve our social media algorithm on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Okay? Yes? So as a quick guideline, if it's your first time to join our career talk, our topic for tonight is about observing business meeting etiquette. What are the do's and don'ts? And what are things that have significantly changed since pandemic and the digital world uh, are mainstream. But don't forget, you can always still ask questions that are outside this topic. So you can ask questions about job hunting, job interviews, quitting your job. It could be about conflict with your manager. It could be an issue uh, that involves your colleagues. Yes. So type them in the chat box and we'll find time to answer them. Okay. Yes. So I'm trying to look at the chat box again. Ooh, Summer, by the way, is asking on TikTok, we're doing daily cadence in the operations. Do you think it's effective or necessary? I think in the operations world, when information is critical to be passed on as frequently as you can, it might be the exemption to the rule. So I do think that it's not 100% that you should not be doing consistent meetings. I am not familiar with your business, Summer, and with your industry, so I will still say it depends. But yes, I am aware that there are certain companies and industries that have no choice but to conduct their meetings on a daily basis. My point here is that it should not apply to all companies. It should not apply to all industries. Ooh, Inmo Studio says, a boss who wants to be present during a meeting but does not participate. I hate those types of bosses. Why? Your ultimate goal is not to contribute. Your ultimate goal is to observe as if you're watching a set of gladiators killing each other in the battlefield and you're the emperor, high and mighty, thinking that you're the only one who's right. Okay. Okay. So can I get a letter R if it's okay for me now to rant? You know what, therapeutic session of mga participants. Can I get a letter R if it's okay to rant? When I say rant, this is the reason why I thought of this topic today. Is that okay? And here's where I'm going to do some reflection and I want to share and I'd like our participants to chip in and tell me what are your thoughts if my feelings are valid. Okay? So I want you guys to be the judge. Tell me if my feelings are valid and tell me if I should have done something different. Is that okay? Can I get an exclamation mark? Okay? So before I share the story, three things about this. Number one, every time I'm about to conduct a workshop with a client, it's always an SOP for me to meet them up. Meet them for 15 to 30 minutes. It could be face-to-face, -face, but most of the time these days, it's via Zoom. It's via Microsoft Teams, for example. So I ask questions such as, what's the audience profile? What platform are we using? What are the things that I need to avoid to talk about? Because there, are some ter there might be certain taboos in your company. Uh, they also ask questions about my module, such as, John, we think we should add this topic. We think we should take out this topic. And I'm very open to that because it's a team effort on how to craft motivational talks or technical talks such as public speaking or business writing. So this morning, I had a meeting, a briefing with a client. And I'm going to be sad to say this. This was a government agency, which I don't want to make it look like I have lost faith in them. But I will say that every time I meet up with a government agency, at least in my universe, they unfortunately are one of the most challenging to talk to. Obviously, I will not name this government agency, but they are a very popular, they're very well known on social media. So here's what happened. 
I was already able to talk to their main organizers, meaning their HR head and their, uh, how do you call this, their operations head, who were the ones who invited me for this. It, it's a one-day workshop, by the way, one-day workshop. Now I'm meeting this morning their IT head. And the reason for that is because the topic is about using email and using messengers to talk to customers. So I ask, I needed to ask questions about what are platforms that you're using, what are allowed to be downloaded, what are not allowed to be downloaded. So I go on to the Zoom session, to the Zoom meeting. I turn on my camera, I turn on my audio, and the person who I'm talking to who's from IT also gets onto the session. To be fair, they were not late, they were prompt, but they did not turn on their video. And they did not turn on their video the entire time. Number one, I would always advocate that if you're meeting for, with someone for the first time, you should be turning on your video. And that is just a matter of respect, specifically because you want to showcase transparency. If you think you have issues with your internet connection, what I would suggest is to turn it on for a few seconds, just show your face and say, John, I want to show my face because I want to greet you properly. But however, I hope it's okay. I need to turn off my video because I'm saving the bandwidth of my internet. And that would be fine with me. This person, however, refused to turn on their video, which is fine. I'm going to let that slip. Okay, That's okay with me. The second thing, however, that started to trigger me was that this person started calling me Joe. So he says, good morning, Joe. Okay, let's start the meeting. Joe, by the way, and then he kept on talking Joe. My name is not Joe. You guys know me. And people call me Jonathan or John because I explicitly state that in my engagements, you can call me John for short. But my name is not Joe. And this guy refuses to change even if I have corrected them many times. That, And I said this in the meeting. I even had to pause and say, excuse me, my name is not Joe. My name is Jonathan or John. You can also call me John. But the guy kept on calling me Joe. And I don't know if he had issues with his internet connection, but he, he didn't even acknowledge what I said. And that is when I realized that he actually heard what I said when he started saying, why are you so rude? He was saying this out of the blue. Why are you so rude? Can you speak in a more polite way? And then I was wondering, is it because I corrected him that my name is Jonathan, not Joe? So I had to answer and say, could you please identify what exactly did I say? And that is the most polite way of correcting it. And I said, please tell me which part of my statements triggered you that I said something rude because I could not recall any of that in those five minutes or 10 minutes. Okay. Can I get an exclamation mark, by the way, if you guys are following my conversation? Yes, I hope that's okay. Okay. So this is where, ooh, I was starting to get triggered because I have never experienced something like this in my 10 years of talking to clients. I started my motivational speaker journey in 2013. I've never had something like this. So that was the first trigger. The second trigger, which I think really blew off my steam, was when he said, excuse me, who is the client here? Okay, can I get a letter C? If you will have an idea what will happen next, okay? So I said, excuse me, who is the client here? And then he wouldn't stop until I would answer the question. Excuse me, you have to answer my question. Who is the client here? Obviously, this guy wanted me to bow down and say that if they were the client, I have to give them the floor and bow down to them. But you guys know Jonathan Yabut, and it's not because I want to become like the VIP. My belief is that in any relationship between a business owner or a client and the provider or a vendor. It is an equal relationship. Can I get the letter E if you guys agree? It is an equal relationship. You need me. I also need you at the same time. I can offer you something that you need for me and I can benefit from providing my services to you. Okay? I was able to hold back because if I really was having a bad day, I would have said something different. I would have probably said, excuse me, I did not apply for this job. You guys invited me. And this was the truth. I did not bid. I did not invite. I was, a, I was invited for this. I can say no. And by the way, this session was about to be canceled. 
ex- except that I told them that they were going to be incurring penalties because they canceled abruptly. When they found out that there was going to be a 30% penalty, they went back and said, okay, we're going to continue the session instead. So that was already strike one for the unprofessionalism. But I didn't say that. I simply said, and here's what I said. You are the client, but that doesn't mean that you have an upper hand in this conversation because this is an equal relationship. And what I'm only asking in this meeting is X, Y, and Z. And then I stated the agenda of the meeting, by the way. By the way, guys, I can't delve onto the details because the moment I see the details, you will have a clear idea which government agency this is. Okay? So the guy kept on talking and he repeated again the statement, you're not supposed to be speaking something like this. This is rude. And again, I asked him the same question. Can you please specify which part of my statement was rude? Up until that time, I'm still thinking that it's because I corrected him by saying that my name is not Joe. My name is Jonathan, or you can call me John. Okay? But here's where I ended. I ended that uh, conflict by saying, I think Mr., and then I mentioned his name, I think the reason why you feel triggered is because in your organization, maybe in the government agencies, you're not used to talking to people who are straightforward and direct to the point like I am. Maybe you've been in this role for so many years. I'm not sure, but that's the impression you're giving me. But if you're working with other people in the corporate world, we're after efficiency. We're after also respect. And so if I say that my name is Jonathan, not Joe, and we don't have a relationship for you to invent what my name is, I think I need to call that out. And we can now move on to our conversation. He didn't say anything anymore because... Someone from the team inserted into the... So there was another person in the team who was observing and who was listening, which was good, by the way, because that means whatever happened, there was a witness. Okay, Christopher Miroy is typing the T in the chat box. There was a witness. And so, unfortunately, all throughout the conversation, when we already went to the agenda... This person was already answering my questions, but most of the time, the person who was answering was the other person instead because this person was trying to manage the tension with each other, okay? Now, before I conclude what happened, this is where I need to call out something that I think a lot of people are missing out when it comes to business etiquette, when it comes to meeting. Number one, if you are meeting someone for the first time, you do not have the right to tell them and label what exactly is their name. And I posted, you know, I just posted something on TikTok about this a few minutes ago. If their name is Samantha and you find it very long, if their name is Stephanie or Jonathan and you find it very long, you do not have the right to shorten their names and decide what their nicknames are. Can I get an exclamation mark if you guys agree? You don't. You don't. Number one, You're not close with each other, and you don't know each other. Number two, you're not in a party. You're in a business transaction. You are in a business meeting. The least that you're supposed to be offering is professionalism. Okay? Number three, if you're really lazy because you don't want to call that, which you shouldn't be, by the way, and if you don't want to call the person by their long name, or you want to be chummy with the person because you're getting a good vibe with their name said, ask how they want to be addressed. Can I get the letter A if we're clear with that? Ask how they want to be addressed. So at the beginning of the meeting, tell them instead, Mrs. Reyes, thank you for attending this meeting. I appreciate that you made some time. May I ask how would you like to be addressed in a meeting? Should we call you Annabelle? Should we call you Mrs. Reyes, etc.? That is where you seek permission. And again, we're not in a club We're not in a party. We are in a business transaction, okay? This applies across the universe, regardless of which culture you are talking to. The only time that you can call someone their nickname or whatever name is if they gave you permission because they gave their name to you. Please take note, names are integral possessions of one's identity. It is one of the most sacred things that you can have in your life. So don't call me Joe as if we're close, Right, And I will not call you as well with whatever name. Even if I see your name, for example, in Zoom, right, I would still ask, how would you like to be called? Mike, is that okay? Right? Sheila, is that okay? Stephanie, is that okay? 
So that irritated me. And I'm like, wow. I thought that I, you know, in all of my 10 years of speaking engagements, of engaging with clients, and this was happening on Zoom, by the way, I thought that this was something that would only happen in fiction. I thought that this was something that would only happen in exaggerated case studies. It does happen in real life. Right? And I am going to use that in my future workshops because I want people to appreciate this is so petty and yet it still happens okay? in a lot of workplace. Okay. So could you please type in the chat box, was I making a big deal out of it? Some people in TikTok says you are. <laughs> so same thing, for example. Uh, so I'll give an example. I'm going to flip the coin. When I know that in the company, the culture of the company is that they call each other ma'am or sir, even if that's not my culture, I will call them ma'am and sir. Why? That is the convention. That is the corporate culture that they follow. So I'm going to abide with that. Okay? Especially when I'm the one who's asking for a meeting in the first place with them. Okay? So people are saying, no, that's proper. Okay. Chikoi says, I didn't know it's a big deal. It is going to be a big deal. Imagine, for me, huh? imagine, I'll give an example. You're pitching for an investment with a set of investors, or let's say you're, talk, you're selling insurance, you're selling real estate, and you're talking to a client for the first time. Their name, for example, is Annabelle. You don't have the right to just simply call them out as Belle or Anna, right? You're going to get an eyebrow after that, okay? And here's where I'm going to challenge that because I think as Filipinos, sometimes we have a tendency to think that because we're a very close-knit culture, we often think that it's okay to be chummy. It's okay to feel like we're close to the person, but people do need their space. And people have the right to keep that space. Again, this is not a party. It's not an acquaintance. It's not a club. It's a business transaction. Most especially when you guys are about to talk about money. You guys are to talk about uh, a, a deal that in, in, requires signatures, for example. Okay. Chico y Gonzalez says, that's why I don't want to talk to people from the corporate world because I'm not used to things like this, but I am learning. Uh, yes, it can be intimidating at the start, Chico, but my take is that it's also similar to learning a different culture. At, in the first instance, you won't be used to it because you're new to it, but that's how life is exciting. You get to grow. You get to learn something new, right? I'll give you an example. When I was working first time, my first year in telecommunications company, I got scolded by my boss because our vendors were copied in an email, and I still kept on typing confidential information that our vendors were not supposed to know. So in front of everyone in that email, my boss said, Jonathan, please stop copying the vendors in the meeting. I took it personally. And now looking back 20 years later, I realized that was really a mistake that would irritate someone. And maybe for some people, they think it's not basic, but it is only logical to do so. So that intimidated me. That made me afraid of my job. But as you go along, when you make more of these mistakes, you become more confident and you get to apply what you have learned. That's how the corporate world works. My only issue is the guy I was talking to was in his 50s. Okay? He was in his 50s. So I'm going to insert something different. Maybe, maybe, okay, here's where I'm going to flip the coin again. Maybe the person was being fatherly. Can I get the letter F? Maybe the person was being fatherly about it. That's the only thing that I can think of. That's why he started to call me instead with a different name. Lulu Paco Garcia says, perhaps you're being sensitive about it. Maybe I am. But I will never, if I'm talking to someone in the office, I will not, I don't need to say if you're talking to Bill Gates, you don't call him Bill, right? If you, right? Those person may be different level. But I will never call someone with an invented nickname. Agree? 
Can I get the letter I? I will never invent their nicknames. If their name is Stephanie, I will not just randomly call them as Steph. Because at the back of the person's mind, they will say, close tayo. I don't know you. I'm meeting you for the first time. Right? Someone has asked TikTok, which government agency is this? Uh, I can't. I can't share which government agency this is. I'm going to give you a clue, though. If you guys know my calendar, which we display publicly, you will have an idea which agency is this. I oh, know you won't because we, they moved the schedule. But anyway. Oh, I also like this comment from Marjun. Don't generalize government employees. I agree. I agree. Again, I'm just saying margin for my universe. Uh, ooh, you know, I will say this. Uh, the department of, which one I would say always gave me good experiences if I was working with a government agency. Uh, okay. Here's where I think I've always had good experiences. Whenever I do a talk for a public university or a public college, I often notice it's a very well-organized event. So I do think they fall under government agencies. So yes, there's light in the tunnel. Okay. Um, team, gladiators in suits. I'm going to... I'm finished now with my rant, and I feel way better now. <laughs> oh, by the way, I called HR after that. I, I called HR and told them the issue, and I told them, this is so ironic because our workshop is about customer service. Okay? It's about customer service, and I am going to talk about how to talk to people in meetings, and ironically, what happened a while ago is this. So there. Okay. Oh. I feel bad as well. Um, Sha Song Ju says, it's depressing you took so long to give one example of a government agency you found easy to work with. I, I feel sad as well because, uh, again, the point is not to generalize. But the point here is we're seeing it out of care. Remember, guys, I've been vocal about this. At some point in my life, I do want to work in the government. I do want to serve in public service. And that's why I'm frustrated because I do want to be able to see those agencies change or I want to become a vessel for that change to happen. But yes, you're true with your observation. It took me a while for me to name a government agency. Yes. Yes, unfortunately. Okay. Team uh, Tanjiro now suddenly had to, had to call himself. Oops, our, wait. Let me just pick up our, how do you call this, our microphone. Just wait, guys. There you go. Microphone was out because Tanjiro was, Tanjiro, come here again. Let's show yourself. Just so we can be in a good mood. Okay. Tanjiro's here. Say hello. He was listening to our Zoom call this morning when that happened, by the way. By the way, on Saturday, we're going to be giving away a few tickets later on. Tanjiro is going to be part of our motivational talk. June 24 at the SMX Convention Center in SM Aura, 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m. So please wait. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be giving away free tickets as long as you answer our trivia question. I hope that's cool. Okay, let's, uh, Art Neil says, magpa-blind item ka, John. Hint, please. You know, I should do an episode such as, because I can really brag about this. We've worked with so many organizations, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. So it's always interesting to have an idea how people talk to you, the way they conduct their meetings. I'll give an example. I've been to a lot of companies where in the organizer was the one who started talking, but because the person perhaps was not confident. Suddenly, the boss takes over. 
and that organizer never had a chance to talk again. You know, whenever I see that incidents happen in a meeting, it sends me a message that there is something wrong with either the recruitment or the leadership culture in this company. I get to notice those things. And they're often unique per organization, per company. There are companies, for example, that give you 50-page contracts, 50-page contracts for you to speak for one hour motivational session with weeks and weeks of accreditation, which I don't understand. And these kinds of companies that give me the idea that there's so much bureaucracy, I can just imagine how the rest of their processes are too tedious that it frustrates the people because it takes 50 people to approve a document. I've met those companies as well, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. So it's interesting. And that's the reason why I love my job because I get to be exposed to how different cultures, private company, multinational company, government agencies, family-owned businesses, for example, right? We get to see which companies are very obsessed about they need to get... uh, the invoice, the OR on this specific date, for example. And some companies don't care about documentation. So those things do matter. Okay, I'm going to give the floor to you guys now. So could you please start (laughs) typing in the chat box, what are your questions about business meeting etiquette? And again, I'm not going to limit it to that. I'm going to let you ask questions if it's related to quitting your job, job hunting, conflicts with your manager, etc. Okay? Uh, Brian Kutin on YouTube says, you look like Martin Rivera. Um, I don't think so, but I will take that as a compliment. Paolo Santa Isabel on Facebook is saying, this is also applicable. John, what you just said is also applicable to a close colleague. Do not call them nicknames or signs in front of the person or group. Oh, in a first business meeting. Gosh, thank you for raising this. Okay. So I remember this. This was a mistake that I was very guilty of when I was a junior. I was 25 years old, and I, I together with my teammates, called our boss mother because she was like a mother hen. We call her mother. Mother, can I ask for etc.? Or every time we talk to her because we need some support about our presentation, etc., we called her mother. That was our terms of endearment. And then in a high-level meeting with a CEO, with the vice presidents, And I was presenting something in front of them. And my boss was with me in that meeting. During the conversations when I had to consult her, I also called her mother in front of the crowd. And I remember my boss was so disappointed. After the meeting, even if I knew I had an amazing presentation, the first thing that she did was to huddle us in a room separately. And so I was wondering what went wrong. I thought the presentation went well. And she said, John, next time, please do not call me mother in front of my counterparts. And the reason for that is because we are close, but in the eyes of the other people, I lose a level of respect. I lose a level of credibility. So you don't need to say that. You can just address me as my name. Can I get an exclamation mark if you can understand what happened there? Yes. Uh, Again, when you're too close for comfort, sometimes you have to question yourself. Sometimes you have to shrug it off and go back into professional mode. After all, we're in a business setting here. And if we do not apply a modicum of professionalism, it destroys how we take an agenda, an agendum seriously. So some people might say, oh, ang arte, arte, hindi naman kailangan yan. You don't need that. It's just a matter of formality. I don't think so. There is going to be a minimum standard we need to employ so that when we talk to each other, it contains respect. It also contains a level of efficiency so we don't beat around the bush. It also helps us understand that no matter how big or small you are in the company, meaning you may be the vice president, I may just be a staff, I may be the janitor, etc. Regardless of what your position is, each of us deserve some level of respect equal amount of respect as human beings. Okay? That's why etiquette happens. And unfortunately, business etiquette is not something that you buy from national bookstore, read it up and apply it. Etiquette can also vary from one company to another. Etiquette can vary from one society also to another. But I also think that there are fundamentals that you shouldn't be missing out, regardless of which country are you operating on. 
Okay. Woo, I like this. From TikTok, uh, Malaus Kapampanga says, at this modern time, is it okay to use the phone for taking down notes? One, please expect that whenever you use your phone in the middle of a meeting, even if you're just writing notes, certain people in that meeting will always think that you're using it for something else and therefore it's disrespectful. Even if you are not using it for TikTok or for Facebook, people will think that you are or you're checking on your emails. Can I get an exclamation mark if you guys agree with this? Yes. So when that happens, I will recommend two things. Number one, if you are in good relationship with the people in the meeting, before the meeting starts, call their attention and say, hi team, is it okay that I take down my notes via my smartphone so it's more efficient for my end? It doesn't hurt to tell it to them. And you now have the license to tell it to them because you have established rapport. You have an emotional bank account with them in the first place. Okay. Now, if you don't have any established relationship, you're not yet close, you're meeting for them for the first time, I think you can also ask the same thing. But here's where somehow you have to balance your acting to be safe. And this is me being conservative. Even if I think I should use my smartphone, I will use my notebook instead. Or a laptop, for example. But I will also still mention, team, I'm taking down notes using my laptop. I hope that's okay. okay? Sometimes, and this might help, sometimes you need to exaggerate your actions. Sometimes when you're typing, you look at them, and after you talk to them, make it look like you're copying what they just said, and then you go to your smartphone or to your laptop, and then type what they are saying. When they get to see their gestures and behaviors, they will have a good idea that you're not using your smartphone or your laptop for personal or business reasons, it's because you are taking down notes. Unfortunately, you have to cover the level of acceptability. In certain countries, even in the Philippines, people are still not used to people using their smartphones. So if you think that you're talking to people who are not used to seeing others using their smartphones or laptops, I'd go to the side of being safe. I'd use my notebook instead. Okay? Or, as I mentioned a while ago, you really want to push for progression, fine, but tell it to them. Okay? Tell it to them that you're using your laptop or your smartphone because you want to be direct in documenting your information. Okay? Thank you. That was a very delicious question to answer. Writing on iPad, that also works. You know, sometimes when you have your phone and then you're just writing and scribbling it down like this and people see it, that also works. Oh, I like this. Igme on TikTok says, in our company, all mobile phones are placed in the middle of the conference table. That works. When I conduct a workshop and a workshop is around half a day, or one whole day, there are two things that I do. Number one, I ask the organizer prior to the meeting, days before the meeting, to prompt in the email invitation that this meeting should be taken seriously. Therefore, you may bring your laptops or smartphones, but you will only be given window time to check them. For the rest of the day, you will not be using your smartphones while the speaker is talking. During my talk, at the beginning of it, I create a dedicated slide and I show that slide and indicate that you should not be using your laptop because a day is just a day of investment, okay? No matter how important, if it's really that important, you can step out of the room. But for most issues, for most concerns, usually the day can pass by without you having to attend them. So I'm going to request the participants to please do not open your smartphones, your devices, and your laptops as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Mary Lynn Borbor says, every time we have a new hire, our HR introduces us by our nickname followed by our position. I think it's the culture, but we often use the words sir, ma'am, and miss. So it doesn't matter because... If you are being introduced, that means you're giving permission to others, and that's fine. Okay? But if there wasn't any proper introduction, don't just blurt it out and call them as if you guys have known each other for 100 years. Oh, 
Ooh, okay. Art Neil Fernandez in Facebook says, How would you address someone in a meeting who raises something or asks a question that you don't have an answer yet or raises it to a different topic? Okay. In a meeting, when I do not know the answer, and this is where I want to be ethical. I want to highlight this to everyone watching this video. Please do not invent. Do not pretend. If you really don't know the answer, it's going to be worse if you make it up because the moment you share it with others, they're going to remember that. And that can spell out wrong decisions for the company. So what I would say and make it graceful is I would say, oops, sorry, I missed this out. Can I get back to you after this meeting? And I will inform you what the correct number is. Okay? So you, are, you have two things. Number one, you apologize for missing it out. And number two, you're graceful because you're telling them that I forgot something, but I'm not just going to let it slip. I'm going to do something about it. Give me a few hours. Okay? I'm going to get back to you at the end of the meeting. I'm going to get back to you after lunch. I'll get back to you by end of the day. I will email this information. Versus simply saying, I don't know. Or, sorry, I don't have the information. Don't leave the person empty-handed. Okay? Now, I'm going to answer the second thought of Art Neil. What if during the meeting, the person suddenly shifts the conversation into a different topic and yet you're not yet finished with the topic that you are talking about. So I would say something like, ooh, Joanna, I'm going to park that idea. That's a very important point, but let me park that first. Before we go to that, can I first finish the conversation we're talking about on X, Y, and Z? Okay? So you're able to park Joanna's idea without sounding rude, okay? And at the same time, you acknowledge that their idea is also worth talking about. Okay? Sometimes you can also say, ooh, Joanna, that's a very good point. However, let's stick to the agenda because for the next 15 minutes, we have to decide on X and we only have limited time for that. I hope that's okay. And then we leave that conversation to another meeting or to an offline meeting instead. Okay? Art Neil, I hope I was able to answer your question. Okay. I like this. Lulu Paco Garcia, do you have to ask permission from the party if you intend to voice record a meeting? Before I answer this, let's first go to the digital tools today. In Zoom and Microsoft Teams, remember, if it's a video call requiring your voice, it's impossible for you to record that meeting without consent because all the members of that meeting will always be given a prompt. Some people may agree, some people may not, but they will be notified, which means that if they don't really want it to be recorded, they're going to call it out. Okay. Number two, my take here is that it will depend on the nature of the conversation. Okay. Nature of the conversation meaning I will record it if I'm using it for documentation purposes because I want to get back to it later on for my minutes of meeting. Okay. If that is the only thing that I'm going to use it for, I will record the meeting as is. Number three, however, if I think that the meeting is going to be very critical with a lot of confidential information, and likely that's already, that's already made known in the agenda before you even start, I think you should be asking permission okay, from others. Okay? If you're also someone who's presiding a meeting, if you think that you have an information that must not be shared with others, I think you should make a disclaimer during the meeting and say, team, this is offline. This is offline conversation, and this is something that must only be kept within this room. And then share your thoughts. Okay. Uh, side note, when I am making a phone call to a customer service hotline, let's say an airline, a hotel, whatever it is, a bank, I record my conversations. Why? If I know that the complaint is so major... I want to be able to document what happened because whatever was done to handle my concern can dictate the next steps afterwards. So those things I do record. Ooh, okay. I also like this question from Leng. When is the right time to call out someone publicly versus privately? My take, I am a believer that you should praise people publicly. And the reason for that is because when you want to recognize them, you want other people to understand 
what behavior should be reinforced. So you inspire other people to also do the same act. I'm also a believer that when you're apprehending someone, as much as you can, apprehend the person privately. And the reason for that is because not only will it touch the person's emotions, I think that the reason why the people committed a mistake is also a very private issue. So for example, if they're always late to the office and the reason for that happens to be they have an issue with their family, if you call the person out publicly, you will not be able to get an honest answer if you ask them why because they're in front of their colleagues and they don't want to share a family matter, right? But if you call them out privately, there is a higher chance that you will be able to solve the problem because there's more space for them to share their issues. Can I get another exclamation mark? If you, if we can appreciate that. Yes? Now, can there be possibly exemptions to the rule wherein you can apprehend someone publicly and that you think that the benefit of calling out someone publicly outweighs whatever costs that there are? My take is yes, and I have done this sometimes to my team. I'll give you an example. Let's say on social media, one of my team members made a wrong post of a caption that does not jive with the photo attached to it. If I'm going to call out this person, it's not going to be the most embarrassing thing in the world because that mistake happens also to a lot of people. But I think I should mention it publicly because when I call out that person, I'm not only calling this person out. I'm also reminding the rest of the team that's similar to what your teammate just did. I want to remind everyone that we need to be diligent on how we post the right caption and the right photo. Those are the instances where I think it's okay to call out someone publicly. The issue is not major. The issue is something that can be given remedy to immediately. And number three, the reasons are not personal in this case. Yes? Can I get a thumbs up? Can I get a like if you're on the same boat? Or what are your thoughts? I'd like to read them as well. Ooh, I also like this from TikTok. Sha Song Ju says, if they are doing something disrespectful towards someone else in the room, call them out. I would ag I agree. You know, if if I see bullying in the team right in front of an audience, I'm gonna call out that person. Okay? I'm gonna call it out. I will not prolong, of course, because I don't want the time to be eaten up. But I'm gonna call out that person. And another tactic is after the meeting do a private huddle between that person and the other party affected. So you can further explain. You can further call out and extract more information. But I'm going to call it out. Why? You want to send a message to the rest of the team that in that meeting, we are not tolerating disrespect to our team members. Remember, the more you tolerate bad and toxic behavior, the more it sends a message to the rest of the team that it's okay. It's going to be allowed, and therefore, I should not be afraid to do it because this person was able to do it without being apprehended. Okay? The moment you apply favoritism or special treatment to someone, people likely remember it. Can I get the letter R if you agree? People will remember it. It's one of the things that they will always make sure that they will use it in the future if it becomes handy. So... Avoid, if you're a manager or a leader, as much as you can, try avoid showing in public that you're exercising favoritism or special treatment to someone in the team. Okay, let me cover this last question before we go to our prize, to our online contest. Uh, Marilyn Borbor asks on Facebook, is it okay that some of the attendees are not taking down notes? and that they will ask you after the meeting. How can I call out that person? What is the proper approach if the person is older than you? Okay, number one, I do think that just because someone is not taking down notes does not mean that they were not listening. Because I have met a lot of people wherein if the meeting is short and the meeting's agenda is so familiar to them, they don't need to take down notes. They're able to diligently absorb the information. So... If someone still asks a question during the meeting, after the meeting, and I need to give them information, I will do it, number one, 
I will answer their questions still because I want them to be informed. At the end of the day, you want an informed team. Okay? Number two, I will still hold them accountable by telling them, ah, okay, this portion, I mentioned this in slide number five a while ago. Michelle, were you able to catch that part? And the reason why I'm going to say this, and I'm going to still say it in a friendly manner, is because I want them to appreciate that implicitly, this was something that was clearly shared during the meeting, so I'm wondering why you missed it out. And if the person's smart enough, they will get the point. You are pointing out that they were not properly listening. Okay? If it's a first strike instance, I am not going to directly tell them and say, hey, uh, you were not listening a while ago. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because probably something was happening during that time. But if this is something that I have been seeing consistently three times, four times, and the person just doesn't really care, I'm going to say it directly to them, privately. And I'm going to not just going to call them out, I'm going to explain to them why it matters to listen. I'm going to say something like, you see, Michelle, this is the reason why we need to listen properly on top of the fact that it might cause misunderstanding, you notice that every time we finish a meeting, we end up spending 10 to 15 more minutes just to debrief you. And I don't want to eat up this time from you or from myself. I think those 15 minutes could be productively spent on something else. So I remain to be graceful. I remain to be professional. But I am firmly calling out this person for their lack of uh, observing. <laughs> Can I answer this later on? We have an office mate who has body odor. It is bothering everyone, but she is not self-aware. What do I do, says Moonrise. Okay, I'm going to also ask inputs from you guys, so please prepare your answers. Before we do that, can I give away tickets now to our workshop? I want to give away five free tickets to our upcoming session that is happening on June 24. It's a motivational power talk entitled everything will be all right. We're going to talk about managing stress at work. We're going to talk about improving your sources of motivation. It's going to be happening on June 24, Saturday, at the SMX Convention Center in Fort BGC in SM Aura, Taguig. The ticket is only 499 That's for an hour and a half together with Q&A. But I'm going to be asking a question now if you get my question right, and I'll be giving you a ticket. So I'll make it easier you get a ticket and you get to bring a plus one. So we're giving away 10 tickets for tonight. If you guys are all ready, can I get a letter R in the chat box? If you guys are all ready, can I get an R, please? Someone's asking, John, what about your public speaking workshop? Are there any more tickets? Uh, unfortunately, we cannot we're only opening our seats for the paid participants we cannot anymore give free tickets because that portion is already full we already have 102 participants attending the booster confidence workshop so i'm going to give away tickets instead next week for the july session i hope that's okay for now we're only going to be giving tickets for our uh everything will be all right it's the one that i'm showing here sorry here there you go in the screen Okay, so my question now is, ooh, this is about meetings. It's a digital trivia. You guys are ready? Can I get an exclamation mark? Can I get a thumbs up or a like if you guys are ready to start? Okay. All good? Okay, so this is a digital question. Okay, we were talking about meetings a while ago, including virtual meetings. And my question is, and this question, by the way, is related to interrupting people in conversations. Question is, what is that button in virtual platforms like Zoom, Google Meet, or Microsoft Teams that you press if you want to temporarily unmute yourself? Okay? What is that button that you temporarily press. If you hold it, this is going to happen. If you release it, it's going to go back to that original state. What is that button that you press? It's not the mute button because there is no mute button in the keyboard. Ladies and gentlemen, what is that? 
Oh, you guys are so quick. The correct answer, if you guys are not familiar with this, well, now you know for the first time in your life, right? The correct answer is it's the space bar, the universal button for unmuting yourself. So for example, you are by default muted. And by the way, before I continue, can I get an exclamation mark? Are we all in agreement? One of the basic etiquette in a virtual meeting is to keep yourself muted by default. Can I get an exclamation mark? You have to mute yourself by default because anything including background noise can disrupt the meeting. So until you've been called out or you have something to say, that should be the only time that you are unmuting yourself. Yes? So if you need to unmute yourself, the button for that in your keyboard, the universal button, is the space bar. Okay? Congratulations. So let's give three winners on TikTok. And then we'll give one winner on YouTube, one winner on LinkedIn, and one winner also on Facebook. Let me call out now our winners. My winner on, uh, how do you call this? Facebook is Joash De La Cruz. Congratulations. That's the first one. My winner on LinkedIn, sorry, Facebook, uh, YouTube first. My winner on YouTube is Ryan Anthony Tentia. Congratulations. And then my other winner on LinkedIn is Samantha Masangkay. Congratulations, Samantha Masangkay. Now, my winner on TikTok. My winner on TikTok. Uh, three winners, by the way. Why is it that everyone is typing the word mute, by the way. Okay. Uh, nako, it's hard to get winners from TikTok, huh? You guys didn't get it right. Okay. First winner on TikTok is Sherwin Ramos Yo. Ramos Yo. Sherwin Ramos Yo. Second winner is Abby, A-B-I. And then third winner is Mao Alcance. Congratulations. Okay, so all our winners, how do you claim your prize? Please do it as fast as you can because the seats are limited. Send us a private message and we are going to give you instructions on how to claim your digital ticket. Okay, send us a private message on how we can, how you can claim your digital ticket. Okay, cool. There's a space on keyboard. I think people are referring to spacebar. I did not know that spacebar says a. Now you know. I think a lot of people um, are learning that for the first time. It's the spacebar. Okay. Okay. Are we called cool? Let's answer three more questions for tonight before we finish. Uh, another question, podcast question though again. John, uh, when is season three of your podcast happening? August, September. Promise, guys, we're going to release that soon. In the meantime, if you haven't yet listened to our podcast, it's available on Spotify. It's called From Grit to Great. It's all about career management. And it's co-hosted by my brother, Jed. We do a lot of rants about careers, managers, bosses, job hunting, etc. Okay. Let me cover a question now here on Facebook. Question is this from Joash de la Cruz, who also won a ticket a while ago. Question is this. A newly promoted employee dilemma is how to tell his subordinate who used to be his colleague. Okay, so before equals lang kayo. To call him sir. He used to call him by his nickname. What's the proper way of addressing this concern? Okay. Joash, this has a lot of assumptions. Number one, can you not live your life without being called sir? Because if you're actually comfortable without being called sir, then I think you should let it go. But I totally understand because I'm not here to impose. If you feel more comfortable because your company follows by that culture and that context that people call each other ma'am or sir, I think you should do a heart-to-heart -heart talk. This is not something that you just say quickly and briefly, and you need to explain why. You need to explain why you need to be called sir or ma'am. Now, I'm going to be biased here because my take is that 
I don't think you should call each other ma'am or sir. That's my personal take. And I totally respect that there are companies who use that route. What's my reason why I don't think you should be calling each other ma'am or sir? Well, number one, I don't think you should be using labels to impose superiority and to remind people that they are more powerful or earn more than you. A lot of research also shows, and this is psychologically based on research, when you call each other ma'am or sir in a business setting, it creates a barrier between the two of you and it makes the person less open to share their thoughts. If you look at a lot of progressive multinational companies and Silicon Valley companies, because they call each other on a first name basis, their tendency now is that if there is a problem, they can easily call other people's attention. Okay? But I'm not here to impose because culture is not culture is relative. Okay? If you feel, however, that you're more comfortable being called sir or ma'am, you have to talk to the person one on one. Perhaps your reason is because you feel more comfortable, or you can also, you know, if this is really your friend, if this is really your friend, they will be able to understand that if you're not being called sir or ma'am, you lose credibility in front of your counterparts and your colleagues. That's the only thing I'm thinking of. Okay? But I'm really struggling to answer that question. Because in my universe, I, I tell my people in my company, for example, to not call me sir. Call me on my first name. Call me John, for example. Okay. Okay. Joseph Mangahas on Facebook is asking, in business meetings, how do you handle if things go south way, like they raise their voice because I believe they take the feedback personally and told us that we were attacking his or her? I am, and I always practice this, whenever the conversation gets heated and if you happen to be the neutral party, stop it. Okay. I would physically use my hands because usually when you use your hands as your gestures, it creates more force into the conversation. And then I tell everyone in the team, we're going to take a break for five minutes. We're going to take a break for 10 minutes. We're going to let the people cool down. And for that, I'm going to ask other people to also leave the room. Because usually when you have other role models doing the same thing, it works. Okay. Joseph, here's also another tip that's been proven across cultures. There are a lot of research that shows that if a meeting happens with food, can I get the letter F? Meetings become more fun. Meetings become less stressful. Can I get the letter F if you agree? That's why if, as much as you can, serve people coffee. That's why as much as you can, try to insert a specific amount of number, of budget for meetings. And that includes snacks. Okay? Try to set, I mean, of course, it's hard, it's death tone for me to say this because I understand not all companies have budget for snacks for meetings. But as much as you can, if you think that the meeting is very critical, food always takes out the tension from everyone. Okay? So if this happens, I would call for a five to 10 minute break if I have an opportunity, I will ask for coffee to be served. I will ask water or drinks to be served. Okay? Okay, YouTube team, by the way, can I just mention this? You guys have an amazing set of questions tonight, so I am so stimulated. Thank you for that. I'm only as good as the questions that you ask. Okay, Thank Tech Glimpse on YouTube is asking this question. How do you respond when there seems to be a tendency for other workmates to contradict your ideas based on their bias. Okay? I may have done mistakes, but my performance and numbers show good results. Number one, you have to embrace the fact that these people are always going to be close-minded to think that your idea, even if it's a good idea, is going to be wrong. If someone contradicts your ideas in the middle of a meeting, what I would do is not just to contradict back. Try to look for another person in the meeting and ask them their thoughts. This way, you're going to have a third-party arbiter. If you're even more confident that the person you're going to ask outside the parties fighting is going to side with you, ask them. Because that's going to diffuse the tension and the other person will realize that your idea is neutrally good in the first place. So I would say something like, okay, I understand, Joanna, why you did not like what I said. 
Can I get, however, the thoughts of other people in the meeting? Because I think it shouldn't just be the two of us deciding on this. Michael, what do you think of that? Right? Shireen, what do you think of that? Okay? Take this also as an opportunity to question yourself. Because if in the middle of the meeting, the other people are also siding with their idea, and it has happened to me as well. Sometimes I'm confident that everyone liked my idea, but apparently they didn't. And everyone said, no, sorry, John, I think I will go with person X instead. Then I'm humbled. And I think a true mark of a great leader is to not always discover that you're right, but to go after what is rather right and what is best for the team. Can I get an exclamation mark? Okay. So I will take an opportunity to test the ideas. If I'm wrong, I was able to check it out. Okay. Rather than making, I will not like, I don't like to be in a position wherein everyone agrees just because they are afraid of me and just because they think they're going to be called out. I may even be committing a mistake. So I'd rather have people call me out and correct me on the spot as early as now before the issue even gets worse. Okay? Uh, let's go to TikTok. We're neglecting some folks asking question now. Ooh, someone's asking, how old am I? I don't want to share my age because I feel old now. Can I ask folks how old? If you guys have been following me, you guys have an idea how old am I, right? I'm obvious. I probably look good, especially if you're watching me on TikTok. I, I think I will look like I'm in my 20s. Will I pass this one? I'm not. Uh, I'm a very old millennial, I should say. 30 plus. Oh, talaga? So I can't pass anymore in my 20s. Seriously, cannot. Man. Late 20s now. Nope. Uh, too old for that. I don't think I will have the wisdom to even and the confidence to even open a live session and talk about my clients. 41? Grabe naman. You guys really think I'm 40? I'm, I'm nearing my 40s, but I don't think I'm 41. I will say this, however. Every two weeks, I have to use... I have to color my hair because I do have lots of I have lots of white hair already. I'm thir I'm turning 38 in the next two weeks. Turning 38. And this is why the Apprentice Asia is in its 10th year anniversary. Because when we did the show on AXN, I was 27 years old. And I feel flattered because sometimes when I do meetings with clients, some clients still think that I am 27 or 28 because they can't, they're fixated with my vision, my visual of me being in the show. Okay. Uh, let's humor this because it's a fun question to answer. What would you choose? A stressful but a high paying job or a low paying job? but it has an amazing and a good working environment. Whenever I answer questions like this, I would say it depends on your lifestyle and it depends on your goal. If I am young, meaning I can take on as much stress as I can, I think I'm risk lover. I'm in my early 20s or late 20s. I would choose a stressful but high paying job. Why? I'm building my nest and a good amount of money is going to make my life better. But number two, because when you are young, the more you should be pushing yourself to stressful situations, calculated stressful situations that can even make you a better person. You want to improve your tenacity. You want to improve your grit so that when worse problems happen in the future, and likely they will happen, you're even more prepared for them. Okay. So the younger you are, go. Go for as long as you cal Risks are always good as long as you calculate the risk. Go for that stress. And get that high-paying job, right? If you are single, you don't have any... Do you guys have any idea how expensive it is to finally have your own family? I don't have a family yet, but I have a dog. And having a dog alone is a lot of bills to pay. What more if you have a family? If you're young and if you don't have this, all of these responsibilities, go for that high-paying job with the amount of stress as long as you take good care of your health. And if you happen to be a breadwinner, which I think a lot of our viewers are, millennial breadwinners watching this, please make sure that you are properly insured, both for your life insurance and your health insurance. Because if something happens to you because you've been working hard too bad and your health declines, 
you want to make sure that your family is covered for that as well. Can I get an exclamation mark if we can relate to that? Okay. Now, the second option of JET is how about a low-paying job with a good working environment? I would settle down and start to slow down when I'm in my 40s or 50s because I think by that time, what I need is a challenge and excitement that I'm doing something else, but I am not anymore that insecure financially because I've already saved as much as I can. I would choose that route. So the older I get and the more you have established assets, probably at this time you have a lot of idle and passive assets. You have your own car, your own property, you have purchased certain financial instruments. I think money is more about paying your bills, but you still need the healthcare. And so therefore, you still continue working. But I'd rather have a good working environment on my side. Why? The older you get, what matters more for you now are your quality of life, the time that you can spend outside the office, the quality of relationships that you can treat your colleagues as your friends or to a certain extent, an extension of your family. So there. I hope I answered your question. So I did not choose, unfortunately. Uh, if you were to answer me at my age, I would still, because I still, I, I still think I can get it, I would choose the, the former. I still think at the age of 38, right? God bless me with more health, please. I would go for a more stressful still and high-paying job. But when I think I'm settling down in the age of 50, 45, 55, I think I would slow down. And when I say slow down, I've been vocal about this. I want to enter public service, which I think is very stressful, but it's a different kind of stress. Okay. Oh, I sorry, no man. Yung deodorant question, we have to answer this. Guys, okay. I think we should answer this before we end the session, and I need to end the session soon. What do you do? What do you do about a colleague who has body odor? Okay. If this really happens to me, one, I will confront the person privately and I will use one of the techniques that I employ in giving feedback. And that technique is I care for you technique. So the principle behind this technique is people will lower their guards when you're giving them feedback if you state at the very start of that conversation your intention for saying it. And that is... You're sharing criticism not because you want to put them down, but because you care for them and you don't want it to get worse. Okay? So I would talk to them and say, for example, the name of the person is Vincent. Okay? Vince, I want to share you something that may offend you or you may not like, but please know that I'm sharing this because I care for you. We've been friends for the past four years. And we've had those instances where in we share intimate things because I know that you got my back and I got yours. So Vince, ang issue ko lang is every time we're close with each other physically and every time some of our colleagues also are close with you physically, I sense a certain undesirable smell. I think I'm going to use this word. I sense a certain smell that help doesn't help me concentrate with my work okay depends on your personality maybe you can choose the word vince sorry yeah feeling my body odor okay i think some people can pull it off but the point is before you say it share it with your intention of why you need to say it it will lower down vincent's guards so vincent may feel offended of course because it's about hygiene but as long as you tell them vince i need to tell this to you because Sometimes I feel offended also when someone's talking behind your back because you're my good friend. I feel like I'm also being ridiculed. Okay? So there. Joseph said, I have done this to my colleagues. <laughs> Sabi ni Shasong Ju says, Vince, tara ligo tayo. Uh, I would not go to that route. I think, ooh, I remember this. When I, was in, when I was in high school, we had a friend who, so I came from an all-boys school. So the humor among your classmates are different. So we had a classmate in high school na tanggap talaga niya. He really knows that he has bad odor and he always makes sure that he wears a deodorant. So 
sometimes in order for us to give them more feedback about it, this friend doesn't take it personally when like 10 or 15 people in the class, and we're a class of what, 35, 40, 10 or 15 people give him deodorant. He doesn't take it personally. In fact, he loves it because he knows that he uses it. So it depends on your level of relationship. You kailangan mo talagang timplahin. Uh, if I am meeting someone for the first time, I don't know them, I don't have any rapport, I have zero relationship, I will not even raise it. I think I will find a way to just avoid the person physically. Okay? Because it does require a level of relationship. It does require a level of intimacy for you to have a license to tell it to them, even if it's so offensive already. Okay? Another tactic, may I suggest, if you are meeting this person and you know that it really disturbs the agenda, can I suggest, because it's very trendy in the pandemic setting, post-pandemic, do it outdoors. Don't do it in an air-conditioned, closed venue. You're going to have a hard time meeting with this person. Do it outdoors. Do it in an alfresco restaurant. Right? Do it at the balcony of your office if you have that opportunity. Is this one of those situations where you can call them out publicly? No, nope, I will not. I will definitely say this heart to heart and close door, face to face. Call the HR for a grooming seminar. Wede, yes. Okay. Uh, someone's asking when is the ticket for our workshop? That is happening. Let me just display that again. That is happening on June 24, Saturday, 5.30 p.m. at the SMX Convention Center, SM Aura. Okay. For those who may not be familiar as well, we are conducting, we still are offering seats available on June 21 and June 24. June 21, that's already on Wednesday. So the session is about leadership and hybrid work era and also level up your social media marketing happening on June 21 three hours each. On June 24, o oh, diba, lagari ako, ang dami kong workshops na kailangan tapusin. June 24, morning is e boost your confidence and June 24, Saturday afternoon is email etiquette and business writing. All of these workshops are conducted in the same room. So we have a lot of participants who are buying tickets for all the five workshops. We also offer discounts for that. Okay? Okay. Gladiators in suits. I think this is one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had with you. Can I get an exclamation mark if you guys agree? Dapat pala, I should be spilling a lot of tea. A lot of an uh, insider joke. I wish I can, but that's breaching confidentiality with some of my clients. I think I should start. Okay, here's what I can do. I, I can share some of my memorable instances with clients. And then I'll add a moral lesson afterwards. Without, of course, telling who the client is. Okay? All good. Ooh, last one. For folks who happen to be in the north, if you happen to be in Clark or Olongapo, we're going to see you there July 7 and July 8. We are conducting public speaking, business writing workshops and leadership workshops as well. You can go to our website, jonathanyabut.com, to get your tickets. Please hurry. We're selling all the tickets as fast as we can. And if you'd like to get copies of our best-selling books, uh, ooh, I don't have copies with me right now, but I'm going to show that on the screen for our Facebook folks. Our best-selling books, Certified Bestseller by National Bookstore, is available in Fully Booked National Bookstore, also available in our official stores in Lazada and Shopee. The book is 399 pesos each, and we give discounts if you buy all four. Okay, I'll catch you soon, Gladiators in Suits. I probably will go online early tomorrow. If not, I'll go online on Wednesday, same time, 8 to 9 p.m. We'll catch you soon. Thank you for listening. Thank you for this uh, funny and enjoyable conversation. Stay safe.